What the roundtable does is ask that difficult question. Why can't people live where they want to live? Why can't children have the same educational opportunity? Why can't people have the same economic opportunity to start a business in the city or apply for a job that they feel they're capable of? The questions that they ask um, are necessary questions um, and they're hard questions and quite frankly in many, in many ways they're the questions that people think have already been answered. That's what we're trying to do at the round table. Move the conversation so we have regional solutions, regional answers to those tough questions. You have a lot of conversation happening and a lot of initiatives happening right now that talk about quality of place again and talk about talent, talk about the importance of education. And we have to be reminded through groups like Michigan Roundtable that you have to look at it in terms of equitable solutions. We get youth, we get clergy, we get uh, school administrators and the like, government folk, and we ask them what's going on in your community, and we report that out. And that becomes a really powerful tool because now the government officials can hear what their citizens think. And it's our hope and our plan to carry our work statewide. Over time, the work of the Roundtable has progressed. In the last two years, we've moved more to a community-based organization working in the area of civil rights and social justice. And in our community work in Plymouth Canton, in St. Clair Shores, and at Mount Pleasant, we try to look to what, what is the community telling us? What do they want to look like? We work with them to transform their community into a place they want to be. They've got data, and so when people will say to them, do we really still need a civil rights organization still in 2010? Is that, isn't that work taken care of? They can tell you in really concrete ways and show you in very concrete ways how it has not been taken care of and there's still so much to be done. For instance, we'll, we'll bring in a demographer to show the community their history, where they were and how they got to where they are today. What does that community look like? Another way to find out the opinions and the perspectives of the citizens is to use focus groups. And those become powerful, powerful statistics and opinions when it comes to how the community views itself. I think what's most impressive is that they have uh, a focus on client satisfaction. So when they're taking on a project, I mean, it really is about identifying the problem, identifying the solution, and then implementation. And what most impresses me about that is that's how a private sector for-profit business would run. What causes us to move in the areas we do? One is changing demographics. A number of the communities surrounding Detroit are changing from a population perspective. Plymouth Canton, a community that was 10 years ago 90% white, now is 70% white. And what our work centers on is actually starting the conversation. How do we get people to talk about recognizing the other in their community? And it's no better time than now. Having grown up here, I don't think I had quite the sense of how much these communities have changed until I was sitting in that room with 200 people and there were people of totally different races and ethnicities and religions and it was really exciting to sit there and hear um, people express their beliefs and their thoughts about the community they were living in and the, their vision for the future of the communities they were living in. I think we're growing leaders, and what's been good about that is that we've had some leaders from the community. There's been offer of training, mentorship. People are now learning more about the process. With the folks that we're working with now, they are very committed to making this a grassroots initiative because we definitely want to see some change. History plays an important part in illuminating the present. For instance, when we talk about housing, that history plays a very important role as to what's going on here today. Uh, we like to say where you live shouldn't determine how you live or if you live, but unfortunately it does. We recently had a mock trial in the fall of 2009 at Wayne State where the defendant was the Federal Housing Administration. We had a great day of talking about the effects of housing, how it affects healthcare and opportunity and education. 
The plaintiff in this case is Marvin Miller, and he brings this case of race discrimination against the Federal Housing Administration. This was the United States of America speaking as to how we wanted the, the housing to operate in the 1930s and 40s. And, and what we were saying as uh, citizens, and it was the white majority that was saying it, is we want to make, create a system where black people are excluded from uh, white neighborhoods. Even if you had the income, even if you had the money, the down payment, what have you, to buy in that neighborhood, and it was already FHA approved, the covenant in the deed would restrict the seller from even selling the home to you. Detroit is the way it is today because of the past several decades. And if you don't understand that past, you're never gonna deal with the present and you're never gonna have a better future. I'm so proud of where the round table is right now because I think that it's so innovative. It's a richer organization in terms of its programmatic offerings, uh, in terms of its thinking. The Roundtable's mission is very simple. It's helping to build sustainable, inclusive communities. We just don't want to come in and leave, but we want to create a foundation and a funding stream that continues our work. There's no question they're in it for the long haul, but I think everybody would agree, including the staff at Michigan Roundtable, that it would be nice if there wasn't a need for the Michigan Roundtable. But for the foreseeable future, there will be. And so um, I wouldn't hesitate if I knew that somebody was looking at something in terms of mediation, or problem solving, or even problem recognition, this is the place to go to kind of work through that. I love the fact that they're still here asking those questions because there is so much that is yet to be effectively resolved. You can have diversity, but if everyone's not seated at the table, you're not inclusive. So we need to have uh, people of different color and different religions and ethnic minorities at the table. They have to be represented in public life, in the schools, and in the police force. Then you become a truly inclusive community.